Well, welcome everyone to our discussion of governance for a new era. I'm Ann Neal, president of the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. And ACTA is pleased to be hosting this discussion today among four immensely knowledgeable and committed leaders who just happen to be four of the signatories to the Governance for a New Era report. You will find their signatures, along with many others, in this beautiful new publication in what has prompted some casual observers to call it the Trustee Declaration, uh, but what those in the know call the Schmidt Report, affectionately and appropriately named in honor and in recognition of the chairman of the project. I think I can say without hesitation that the project chairman, Benno Schmidt, who incidentally is also a recognized constitutional scholar and former president of Yale University, and the members of the CUNY board have modeled the engaged, informed, and thoughtful stewardship that this report seeks from all boards across the country. There simply is no one more qualified to tackle the important issue of how our colleges and university governance can be a strength and not a liability so that American colleges remain the envy of the world. ACTA is not a signatory to this report, but we were happy to work with Chairman Schmidt earlier this year to convene key leaders to discuss higher ed governance. We had no expectation of what would come, but quite frankly are blown away by this bold and compelling report that we are sending to our network of more than 15,000 trustees across the country, along with governors and state legislatures. We believe this is a message that is positive and timely. The American public is frankly out of patience with higher education and has every right to be. It's great that some rankings put our universities at the top of the international charts, but for the average family with college-bound students, that's not enough. Media each and every day have criticized, have criticized higher ed with stories about quality and cost, students buried in debt, unable to buy a house or start a family, facing loan defaults and blighted futures. Many employers are not happy with their newly hired college graduates, finding them short on the skills they reasonably should expect them to have. Public confidence is low, and the president himself has been one of the most vocal in raising concerns about quality and cost. The survey actor released today surely confirms his concerns and more. Taxpayers and families don't believe they're getting value for their investment. They see tenure as a system that adds to cost and compromises quality. They fear that political correctness and intolerance are undermining the free exchange of ideas. Most of us in this room cannot think of a time when the value of higher ed has been so significantly under attack. There's a growing awareness that the same old just won't work. Michael Crow, president of Arizona State University and a signatory to the report, offered this observation, and I think he's right on. The old adage is really true. If you want the same result, keep doing it the same way. Thus, if you want higher education to change its outcomes and its costs, then we must also modernize and emphasize governance systems. We can achieve through governance the objective of enhanced educational outcomes with higher level value and economic responsibility. I think all of our panelists today will tell you that these are not usual times, and new times demand new thinking. ACT is pleased to bring these terrific individuals today together to discuss this report with you. All of them bring a profound love and commitment to American higher education and a belief that if we are going to make the kinds of improvements we need to remain the finest in the world and to ensure that our college graduates can compete in the global marketplace, trustees are going to have to press for reform, measure it, and demand results. Faculty expertise is at the heart of any successful school, but faculty cannot determine cost effectiveness and individual departments cannot set priorities for the institution. Colleges and universities must answer to the students and taxpayers and trustees alone are expected to bring the big picture to the table. Sadly, we look no farther than Penn State to see what happens when trustees view themselves more as boosters than stewards of the public interest. So in the next few minutes, you'll hear from Benno, who will talk about the report, its findings and recommendations, and then from three signatories, Tom McMillan, a businessman, former congressman, and outstanding scholar athlete who brings a special interest and expertise in collegiate sports. 
John Engler, former governor and head of the Business Roundtable, with a real eye on employers, what employers are looking for, and the added perspective of a former governor focused on higher education excellence. And third, Professor Richard DeMello, a businessman, technology expert, and professor focused on the 21st century university. Thank you, all of you, and Benno, take it away. Uh, thanks, Ann, uh, and thanks uh, for being here, and I want to thank my fellow panelists and, and friends uh, here at the table. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your comments. If you look at American universities, uh, our top universities, the places where I used to work, Yale and Columbia and so forth, if you look at our top universities, they're very, very strong. Uh, they do a very good job. They're internationally uh, renowned as the best in the world. And I think the, the presence of these great universities at the top sometimes gives us a sense that the whole enterprise of higher education in the United States is, uh, is in pretty good uh, condition. It is not. If you, when you get below the best universities, what you see are a number of very, very serious problems. First, you see student uh, success rates uh, are very low. At many four-year institutions, uh, only 50 percent or so of the uh, students who start out in them graduate. In community colleges uh, around the country, where 45 percent of all the students in higher education uh, are, are situated, in community colleges, the graduation rate is only 25 percent. Three quarters of the students uh, uh, fail in these uh, institutions. Um, moreover, even the students who graduate, uh, there's uh, considerable evidence that they don't know enough to hold good jobs. The Business Roundtable uh, and employers have said the number one problem with the college graduates they hire is that they're not ready to go to work. They're not able to solve uh, problems and think critically. They're not able to communicate clearly in writing uh, or, or, uh, or uh, orally. Um, so even for the students who are successful, and there are thousands and thousands of students who fail uh, and drop out, many more than our high school dropouts that we <laughs> read so much about, um, there is great concern about the students who who succeed and get diplomas, are they ready for the uh, workplace? Uh, the second problem that one sees is that costs seem to be out of control. For as long as we can remember, college uh, tuitions have been going up at two or three times the rate of inflation, two or three times the level of ordinary uh, family income growth. Uh, and uh, at many institutions, the, the, the whole cost structure of the institution seems to be broken, and the institution seems to be moving to levels that are uh, not going to be affordable uh, for many families, and this at a time when, uh, state, uh, when states are taking costs away from the uh, pu public universities because they can't afford to uh, support them at the levels that they uh, have um, uh, historically. So you have a system where many students fail, where costs appear to be out of control, where students who graduate uh, are not, in the view of employers, uh, uh, ready uh, to go to work. Uh, and. Um, and that the system is under tremendous stress and pressure from technological change, as I hope we'll hear from some of our panels, uh, as there is more and more online education uh, and, and the for-profit sector is the fastest growing part of, of American higher education and is attacking the traditional uh, universities uh, uh, with, uh, with their competition. So these are times when there's massive public criticism, where there's technological disruption, 
where there's uh, signs that, that costs are out of control. And it seems to those of us on the panel that these are times that demand uh, active, engaged trustees. Too many trustees uh, have seen themselves as simply boosters and fundraisers. They have not seen themselves as active participants with university chancellors and presidents and, and academic leaders, active participants in defining the university's mission, in insisting that the university stick to the mission and not have mission creep uh, uh, all over the place. Uh, trustees need to pay much more attention to what students are actually getting at the university. What are the learning outcomes that are uh, on, the, uh, on the campus? Uh, uh, and, and trustees need to pay much more attention to the runaway costs that you see on both the operating budget side uh, and on the, on the capital side. It's only with the help of active and engaged lay boards of trustees and the public side, boards appointed by governors in, in many cases, on the private side, boards that are um, <coughs> appointed from, by uh, successors from, from within. Uh, it's only where there, where there are active lay trustees who represent the interests of the general public and in the public universities of the states and regions which uh, those universities serve, only there can we, can, only if we have active trustees can we be, can we see universities focus on what really matters, delivering real value to students and measuring what students are learning keeping costs under control, keeping things like athletics or, or other areas uh, from just running amok uh, and uh, in ways that demoralize the, uh, the, the, the academic enterprise. So my colleagues uh, and I who worked on this are, are asking that trustees become much more active than they have been, much more engaged, that they learn much more about what their institutions are actually doing and what students uh, are getting, um, and that they become critical partners with university presidents and other academic leaders in seeing to it that our universities deliver real value at an affordable and sustainable cost. I mean, that is really, uh, that, that's really the challenge. Um, I'm going to uh, leave it at that. I, I'm interested to hear what, what my colleagues uh, want to add. And then I think we'll be happy to take any questions. Great. Uh, ben, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tom McMillan, and delighted to be here. And Ben, well, thank you for your great leadership uh, on this panel. Uh, you know, the great hockey player Wayne Gretzky once said, I skate where the puck is going to be, <laughs> not where it has been. Uh, having been a, a former sportsman, I can tell you that anticipation is the key to being successful in sports. And so what this report, Governance for a New Era, is about is taking our institutions of higher learning and moving them to the future as opposed to the past. And uh, it's a positive roadmap, and I think it provides a good pathway for trustees uh, to meet their responsibilities as effective stewards. I've been a trustee, a regent of the University of Maryland system uh, for seven years, and I can certainly see accelerating change in higher ed. One of the things that I say frequently at our board meetings is the following, I say, Every morning in this country, matter of fact, in the world, there's an entrepreneur getting up who thinks that they can take on higher ed, take away customers, students, and is backed by billions of dollars. 
And if that's not a sobering thought, because they believe they can do it cheaper, better, more effective, I think they're, 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 uh, it's very clear and cogent what the challenge is. Uh, my former classmate, Craig, Clay Christensen, the sort of written often on disruption, has said that in the next 15 years, over half the colleges and universities in America will go bankrupt. Well, out of 4,500, that would mean over 2,000 schools will no longer be here. Now, that may be a dire prediction, but I do believe the change is coming. And governing in good times when there's growth is very much different than governing when you have enrollment declines and when you're in a period of retrenchment. And that's why the government systems must change. That's why we're all here today. I just want to make four quick points. First, about the idea of boosterism, the, the idea of a trustee being a booster. Certainly that's part of it. You know, rah, rah, support your alma mater. But while you're supportive, you have to be willing to challenge and stand up and to, to, to be a, a sole voice and sometimes against what you think are incorrect policies. The second thing, and most important of all, is transparency. You know, trustees need to have all the information. It can never be withheld. Uh, we are, they're the ultimate fiduciaries. And if they need outside counsel to get to that information, they should have it. And most important of all, from time to time, they need to hear how the students feel about that institution. I can tell you that I've never had any student feedback data as a regent. And I don't criticize the University of Maryland, but I'm saying I think that's endemic throughout the system. We're not hearing from the people who are going to these universities. Third, how long should you be a trustee? It's like being a member of Congress. If you're there two or four years, you don't even know where the bathrooms are. You need to be there long enough to understand the university, especially when you're dealing a four or five billion dollar university. And I think two terms are a minimum requirement. And last, let's talk about athletics for a second because I think it's very important for trustees to have very vigorous oversight of the athletic programs. They cannot be pass, passive observers. Mar Maryland University has set up an oversight board task force. I chair it. You know, the old maxim in uh, governance of higher ed is that if a region or trustee pays attention to something, things get done. Well, that's very true. If they pay attention to athletics, things will be, I think, uh, turn out better. And what you don't want to see is where the conferences or the NCAA dictate to universities, you know, the relationship. I went through that at the University of Maryland. We had seen some confidentiality agreements executed when Maryland was contemplating going to the Big Ten. Uh, the regions weren't given all the information. I'm not criticizing the decision, just the process behind the decision. I think we can do better. Anyway, there's a lot in this report. It's a very positive report. It offers a lot of good guidance. And it's been a real honor to, to be part of it. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I'm uh, delighted also to be here today and uh, join this panel and to be with Benno. And I certainly want to thank uh, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni for the support they gave to this project on governance for a new era. Uh, there's no question it's a new era. Uh, I'm a former governor. Uh, I today work where I get the privilege to speak for business and major employers who hire uh, the product of the university system as our future leader. And they're the men and women who are going to build America, keep America strong, keep America competitive. So we've got a very vested interest in the success of higher education uh, in America, increasingly actually success in higher education around the world, which is one of the challenges. And I'm also, uh, on a personal note, the father of three college sophomores. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's, it's quite personal. And uh, uh, I, I feel the inflation that was uh, mentioned in terms of the pricing of higher education. Uh, and I certainly agree with with the recommendations that are being released today. It is, it is, it is a timely report, and, and the discussion that will follow our, our comments, I think I look forward to very much. I think that there's no question that informed and well-prepared higher education trustees uh, need to be more active in setting directions for their institutions and more attentive to oversight, and I think more willing to embrace accountability. The report gets into all of that in some detail. 
there's one line on the re, in the report that I, I want to focus on relates to my opening comment about uh, many recent college graduates. And this is a quote from the report, suffer from vast gaps in their skills and knowledge and are ill-equipped to compete in the fast-moving global economy. And that, that comes from feedback given by uh, companies who hire these graduates. The competitiveness reports that uh, Michael Porter and Jan Rifkin out of the Harvard Business School uh, still consistently rate U.S. universities as one of our great economic strengths, and that's true uh, certainly in part the strengths of some of the, uh, the top schools that Benno referred to, to some of the uh, engineering and technology uh, education that's available today in America, certainly some of our business schools. But there's no question that strength's at risk, and I think that's why the report, as, as Tom suggested, you know, we, we're, we gotta look ahead, and we have to anticipate, and we could easily lose this advantage that we're so proud of as a nation, and that is a very big concern for the CEOs of the Business Roundtable where I work. Uh, now, I think the blueprint that, that we're releasing today offers some very important, significant guidance, and universities and colleges have gotta focus on the idea that part of that mission is educating students to be informed, involved citizens. And it can't just be a system that focuses on meeting enrollment targets. Uh, again, Benno made the point, it's, it's actually graduation that matters. Uh, we could double uh, college, there's a lot of governors get caught up into, we've got to increase the number of college graduates. We need to graduate the, gra the, the students we enroll. We could double graduation rate right there. Now, what, what an easy uh, opportunity that is for us if we were to do that. But we also got to be focusing on the provision of an education that prepares students to succeed in this global economy. And it is a more highly competitive, uh, more integrated, uh, more complex economy than we've ever known in the history, in our history and history of the world. And the preparation can vary. I, I think that's very important to say this because sometimes when business talks, people hear, well, they're engineering and science, but the course of study can be in liberal arts. There's always gonna be a very high demand for people who can think analyze, uh, write, work as part of a team. There's no question about that. Now, our roundtable uh, member companies, we also represent, as a, as a group, we've got about 210 companies there. We do more than half, more than, half, more than 50% of the private sector R&D that's done in the country, just our 200 plus companies. So naturally, there is an interest in science and technology and engineering and mathematics and physics. So we, we care deeply about some of those, those hard sciences as well. Uh, and the suggestion that uh, you know, we, we need more, uh, we, we do. We need more in terms of quantity. We need more in terms of quality. The release of the blueprint today, I think, um, really gets us uh, underway with a necessary dialogue in America. And, and this dialogue, by the way, is, has been underway. Um, we're gonna get a chance to maybe talk about some of the questions, but there is a final point. Uh, as a former governor, I just wanted to throw this in, that I strongly believe in the straightforward appointive model of higher education. I, I come from one of those states, and there's a reference that most are appointed. There are a handful that are elected. We're one of those, and, uh, and in another week in Michigan, the two conventions of the two political parties will, will be gathered. Believe me, the fiduciary duty and the role of the trustee will perhaps not even be mentioned in the, either of those convention <laughs> halls. Uh, <coughs> um, there will be lots of school colors being tossed about, and there will be a lot of ticket balancing conversation taking place <laughs> in the back room, but it won't be on who's the most effective uh, uh, trustee, who's going to provide uh, that well-informed, uh, well-prepared member of a board. Uh, and I think those are best achieved through a very clear merit-based appointed process. So you've got a, a governor that can be held accountable and that governor, she or he, has got the incentive to seek out and uh, recruit the very best people to, to be a trustee. We actually have major boards in Michigan today where literally no trustees are qualified to be on the audit committee. <laughs> now you wouldn't, you would not in a, uh, probably not uncommon around the country perhaps, but uh, you just wouldn't, there isn't a private sector board in America uh, that would be in a similarly compromised, you know, 
We, we just, it is an embarrassment. And that's, and so when Tom suggests about, you know, that the accountability of getting involved, if you can't even read the budget and know the balance sheet, uh, that's a pretty fundamental gap in oversight. Anyway, uh, this report, uh, we'll, we'll have some fun in a few moments, but I want to thank uh, certainly Benno for his leadership, Tom for his comments. I'll turn it over to Richard now, I guess. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd also like to thank Benno for, for uh, a great experience in, in pulling this report together and, uh, and active for facilitating and, and my fellow panelists um, for, for a great discussion over the last few, uh, few months. Um, I, I think one of the advantages of going last on a panel is all the great stuff is said already. So, so I can I can uh, uh, I can just just refer to the the, um, the motivation for thinking about governance in a new um, a new era. Um, I, I I would like I would like to just kind of expand um, on, on the notion of, of the relationship between between governing boards and and their and their universities. And there is an oversight role. There, 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 there is a role in in um, in holding administrators accountable. But I, I have to say that 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 the the opportunity for partnering with governing boards uh, is is huge in this in this new era. Um, my institution uh, a year ago uh, launched um, uh, a master's degree that was totally based on massive open uh, online courses uh, at about the fifth the cost. Of the um, of the traditional master's degree at Georgia Tech, and I can tell you that with with a confrontational board relationship, that would have been very heavy lifting. With a collaborative relationship with with the the board of regents of the university system, it was it was literally a partnership that walked us down a path to an experiment that would have been impossible to conduct if we didn't have that kind of um, that kind of that kind of board. Um, I, I've been focusing a lot in, in, in my center at Georgia Tech on social contracts and the social responsibility of, of universities. And one thing that you notice when you look around the world is that the only successful models are the models in which, in which there is a, a, an explicit contract between a university and the population that it serves. In the case of a of a civic university, it's 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 civic society. In the case of religious university, it's it's uh, it's it's a different um, it's a different community. But this this relationship is is explicit, and uh, we've been fortunate in the U.S. that that we've had a series of quite inspirational articulations of what this contract is. Going back to John Adams, you know, there's a there's a social contract in the uh, in, in the Constitution of the state of Massachusetts that talks about the duty that society has to cherish the, the institutions of, of higher learning. Think about that. The old, oldest written functioning constitution in the world contains an explicit social contract with, with, with universities. And so when you, think about, when you think about looking forward, who has the interests of society uppermost you know, it's 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 certainly a partnership, and presidents presidents do. But frankly speaking, presidents have also career goals uh, and, and other um, uh, other concerns to um, um, to focus on. Faculty members have a different set of concerns. The only partner in American higher education that has society uppermost in mind is is the is the the, the governing board. So I say that because because. Everyone is exactly right. We're entering a new era. We're entering uh, an era in which in which boundaries are going to crumble, in which student expectations of higher education are going to change. Um, <coughs> technology will will enable things today that would have been impossible um, a, a generation a generation ago. And if we were doing a bang up job in explaining what those transitions were and what they mean for higher education to the general public we probably wouldn't be here today. But the fact of the matter is we've been missing this link. We've been missing the link between what's going on in higher education and what society's expect, uh, expectations uh, are. I, I, I tend to focus on the technology end of this, but uh, you know, I come to technology from, from, from business values. And, and, and from my perspective, we have to think about the crumbling cr uh, trust that, that society has in higher education, these gaps, we talked about the cost, the cost gaps, but what we also see other 
other gaps. There was there was just um, uh, a recent analysis of of, uh, of ACT scores that talked about the number of college students jumping up dramatically, while the preparation of students for entering college drops as a proportion of that number of students. That's a, that's a challenge, and 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 that gap has to be has to be met in um, uh, in in some way. Um, so how does that happen? It does it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen by, by an island of, of thought sort of blossoming and, 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 and taking hold. It happens because these partnerships are, are in effect. And, and I think this, this report articulates a half dozen very common sense principles to think about. What is that social contract going to look like in the, in the future? Um, thank you. Any other comments before we open it up? Let's uh, hear your questions then. Yeah. So, um, without using the B word, blame, it seems to me, have you guys, and it could be in your report, but the K-12 education system that we have here seems to uh, be a part of what the university problem is. Could you just speak to that a little bit, and if you address it in the report, maybe speak to it? or. Well, I, I, will, I will speak to it. Um, uh, at CUNY, where we have uh, about 280,000 students who are regular degree candidates, and, and, about, and another 250,000 or so are in various certificate programs, or what we call adult education programs. Um, most of the students who come to us uh, come to us out of the New York City public schools. And 75% uh, of them who have, who are success, who are high school graduates, who have, who have high school diplomas, are not even close to ready for college work. They're not able to handle eighth grade arithmetic. They can't read or write uh, anything that's the slightest bit complex. And because we have so many unprepared students, uh, you know, we put them in our community colleges, we only have about a 25% graduation rate in our community colleges because most of the students aren't ready even for an associate's degree a program, much less ready for a baccalaureate. So we have tried to work closely with the K-12 system in New York to improve it, uh, and there has been some modest improvement in New York, as there has been uh, some improvement, I think, here in Washington. Um, I mean, there's still huge problems, but, um, but the improvement is not nearly enough. We have vastly, far too many students who arrive at college who are not ready to do college work. And they're not only a problem in themselves, but they erode standards uh, across the board because teachers uh, understandably are, uh, tend to be sympathetic and, and want to help them succeed, so they lower their standards for the students who are prepared uh, in their classes, and it, and it, and it just has a, a, a lot of very bad impacts. So you're right. I mean, we, we have the K-12 system. It has many, many weaknesses and problems. Universities have to deal with it through remediation and through other, uh, other mechanisms. And we're not doing a very good job as a society with this whole problem. That's why our graduation rates are so very, very low, because so many students who go to college are not ready to do college level work. So that is a huge problem and trustees need to look at that problem and make sure that the students who aren't ready to do college level work are not lowering the standards for all students. That's what we had at CUNY before we uh, eliminated remediation in the four-year uh, institutions. The unprepared students were dragging standards down for everyone. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very serious problem, and it's one that trustees ought to be uh, concerned about. You know, 
it's a source of great frustration to me because I, I look at uh, the 700 billion approximately annual spend in the K through 12 system in America, 700 billion, <coughs> and and we're we're just falling so far short. We have university systems whose tuition is far less than we're spending on a per pupil basis in the K-12 system. The Abbott schools up in New Jersey are around $40,000 per pupil. Uh, here in the District of Columbia, reports are between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 per pupil per year. Uh, so uh, the, the public uh, education system, uh, you know, is, it's not because we haven't put a lot of money at this problem, but we we simply aren't getting the, the result. And um, one of the things that I think could be done at the college level that would be supportive, but it's but it is a, a bit of a conflict. It's especially true for I think the community colleges where the the relationship is 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 very close. It has to be. That's the supply chain. The K twelve system is the supply chain for the community college and the university system. But much more candor about how ill prepared students maybe are. Uh, in other words, name names, not 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 individual student names, schools. Uh, you know, we've got 50 students from here, and here's the level of preparation, because parents, I think, don't understand, and there's a lot of overconfidence about how well prepared kids are, uh, in in community after community around the country. So we're, gee, I'm sure glad my kid isn't in that school. We're here, we're doing so well, but. But that's maybe the wrong measuring, and that's one of the uh, motivations behind uh, a higher standards movement in the country, to have everyone really take a close look at the curriculum at the state level. And it's why the governors and the chief state school officers some years ago, and Nancy Grasmick was a very key part of this in Maryland, and she was there, and a lot of the governors on both sides of the aisle. And it's been criticized, sort of from the right and the left, but. But, but high standards are things that we should not be apologizing for, and we need to show what the expectations uh, need to be. And uh, I, I think we've not, we've not done that, and so we, we've kind of been, everybody's been, kind of been kidding everybody, and it kind of moves right along the whole chain. So um, I think part of, part of the, the and, th and this, is, this is the governance issue, that, that enters in here. Part of the difficulty is that incentives are oftentimes not aligned with with, with working on that on that problem. I, I, I hear all too often from from universities that should be focused on on those students that the, well those are students that we don't want. Um, you know we're 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 focused on our rankings and our rankings say that we have to be more and more success uh, more and more selective, which means that that you are you are cutting out the population of students. That actually needs the most needs the most most help. So, um, you know, a single-minded focus at all levels, top tier, middle tier, bottom tier institutions on rankings, has been one of the most destructive forces in 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 higher education. And trustees can be extremely helpful in broadening that focus. It's not going to matter for the top 25, the top 50 universities in the in the country. They have more students than they can. The, than they can handle, but there are 3,500 other institutions um, that that are never going to be a Yale uh, or, uh, or 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 an, an MIT. And and so what Benno said about about institutional mission comes back to roost in those in those sorts of discussions. Uh, yes. My, my name is Catherine Shipnickel. I'm from the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Fire, and we're a watchdog organization for free expression on college campuses. So I wanted to commend you for your comments in your report on um, the importance of protecting free expression. Um, but I did want to say that um, almost 60% of colleges that we rank have um, what we call red light speech code policies, which are policies that are on their face unconstitutional. And I was wondering what the awareness is among trustees, particularly on the mechanisms that college use to suppress free speech, free speech zones, student civility codes, that sort of thing. And is that something that trustees can and should, in your view, be engaging in to um, help 
uh, get greater freedom of expression on college campuses? Well, I, I, I appreciate the question uh, because it, it enables me to state something that I deeply believe. I think the trustees are the ultimate custodians of societies, the public's values that the university or college represents. Uh, the trustees have got to be the guardians of the, uh, of the very, of the basic principles that the, for which the university stands. And in my opinion, there is no principle uh, more important at universities than the preservation of academic freedom uh, and intellectual freedom, the ability to think critically for yourself, to challenge the, the, uh, the orthodoxies uh, of the day. And certainly the boards with which I'm familiar, the CUNY board, uh, is very concerned about freedom of, of expression. And I have found, and, and this was also true at, at Yale, and my experience on, on this point is that boards are far more reliable custodians of basic values like academic freedom than the faculty <laughs> is in its, in its day to day in its day-to-day -day, uh, uh, work. And uh, at CUNY, our board is very, very concerned about academic freedom issues. We would never have, uh, you know, a commencement speaker or a speaker, we would not knowingly permit a speaker to be denied a forum at one of our college, at one of our campuses, because the speaker has controversial uh, uh, views, and these speech codes to which you refer, we do not have them at CUNY. We would not have them. I consider them, as you said, they are flatly unconstitutional, um, and you know they're a very bad idea. Universities ought to be places where students operate in a system of freedom of expression. And if there's some expressions that are, uh, you know, that are uh, disturbing and, and uh, people want to resist, they should resist it with more speech, not by, you know, not by limiting. So I find these speech codes to which you referred, I, I, I would entirely agree with you. That, but I think the trustees are the ultimate custodians of academic freedom, and, and there are a whole number of other institutional uh, values that, that I think the trustees have the long run perspective, not to be caught up in the controversy of the moment, but to protect what the interests, long term uh, values uh, and, and the principles for which, it, uh, for which it stands. And academic freedom is the most basic of all those, I think. I'll just make a quick comment on that. Uh, when I was at the University of Maryland as an undergrad, uh, you know, the Vietnam War was uh, raging, and we had, um, you know, demonstrations, tear gas, very disruptive, you know. And as a student, you, know, you go through that, and you, 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 you wonder how difficult it was for those trustees and the, and the governance of the university to deal with it. Uh, as a regent, you know, we still face these issues all the time, uh, whether to show sexually explicit movies in the student union with legislators threatening to cut our funding. Um, more recently, the riots after our, our, our ACC games that we had that would cause tremendous damage. You know, those are tough issues. You know, it's, you, you I think you have to draw the line on, on hurting others and, and infringing upon other rights. But I think, as Benno said, it is important part of university is this expression of... May, but, may but, I respond to that? Mm -hmm. Because I think it's important to draw the distinction between vandalism, right. which of course is not protected by the First Amendment, or should it be, and the right to protest. And we are in fact engaged in litigation with the University of Hawaii because they have a free speech zone. And our student plaintiffs were told when they wanted to 
protest NSA spying, oh no, no, it's not the 60s anymore. You have to go over to the free speech zone, which happens to be a free speech swamp away from where <laughs> anybody is. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to make sure that those two things are yep. very different since I have four distinguished trustees here. Um, obviously, rioting, you need to stop. Um, but pure speech, I think, um, I hope. Well, there's another one, one other thing, which is a very interesting thing that we've talked about at the Regents. The University of Maryland had a tendency that at its games to be very profane, mm -hmm. and we struggle with that because uh, you know, uh, especially when we play schools like Duke or something, it became a, a, a real <laughs> source of a concern amongst the administration and the coaches and everything. And I think the university did the right thing. They got their coaches engaged. Their players engaged and said, you know, let's, let's, let's stand up for Maryland, let's be responsible citizens. And I think they handled it the right, right way, not heavy handed, but they tried to use it as a learning, learning experience. So they're, they're very, they're difficult issues. We face them all the time. So that's what I'm trying to say. I, I, I think that this is a more, this, this section of the report is going to be uh, one that generates a lot of comment and the idea of disciplinary diversity it is probably going to come as a thunderbolt to a lot of yeah. schools. This, this concept that there ought to be, uh, you know, Tom and I in our prior lives were elected from different political parties. We're part of a process where all kinds of opinions get heard and get argued out. Uh, that's just the way it is. And in fact, that range has probably never been wider than it is today. And it's not always pleasant to watch it, but. It certainly is not appropriate to deprive that from even being possible in some uh, faculties, in some departments, in some schools. So I, th I think that point is going to be an interesting one. The second one, and this is a challenge for Anne and the organization for the council. Uh, one thing I noted in here is that we're coming up on the 100th anniversary next year of the Declaration of Principles by the American Association of University Professors. Yeah. And perhaps that uh, I think there should be a project to reaffirm uh, the centennial reaffirmation of those 1915 principles and let's test how valid they are in 2015. Are they as, as, as meaningful uh, a century later? Because I suspect that that will get you a very vigorous debate that, uh, uh, that and yet uh, I think they perhaps are or should be considered enduring principles that should be reaffirmed a hundred years out. And uh, so that's, that would be the challenge and that, that might to organizations like yours uh, put the issue squarely in front of, of people again because I, I think we've lost a lot of ground in this area and I think there are a lot of closed minds including uh, uh, a, a, an unnamed daughter in, in an unnamed household who had a discussion with her father just this week. Uh, uh, so, anyway. Yes. I have a question regarding um, the relationship of trustee for the administrators in terms of collaborative versus confrontational. And uh, I would be interested to know how your panel looked at or examined the issues, whether you're looking at UVA, at Penn State, or what's going on with the University of Texas. Uh, obviously, one of the things that makes it collaborative versus confrontational is the relationship between the trustees and the administration. And in my experience, many of the trustees who are very, very su successful, sophisticated people who've had a great deal of exposure to the real world come in, but they haven't spent much time with academics. And the academics come in with their mantles and their big vocabulary words, and it gets a little intimidating because you want to have a collaborative relationship, but let's say um, you're concerned about some of the things the administration is doing, and they come in, oh, well, you don't understand. So how, as trustees, how did you all take a look at the kind of intimidation factor for new trustees? who do have some concerns, who are sophisticated people, but there is an intimidation factor when you, when you talk about academics. Well, I mean, this report makes the point that it's uh, very, very rare that trustees do anything on their own. In 99% of the, I mean, about the only thing that trustees regularly do by themselves uh, uh, is a selection of a new university leader. Uh, 
the rest of the time, which is the terms of the regular work, the trustees act through the campus president or chancellor or the provost or, or the other academic leaders of the institutions. So uh, in 99% in of the cases, I think the trustees are in partnership with the with the uh, full-time academic leaders of the institution and, and all of the activism uh, that we call for for trustees, we would say should also be reflected in the university president or chancellor or the other, uh, the other academic leaders. The one area where the partnership uh, needs to have some clarity is the trustees need to hold the college presidents accountable. And there needs to be a regular setting of goals, which is not a unilateral activity by the trustees, but is a result of collaboration between the trustees and the academic, full-time academic leadership of the campuses about what the next five-year goals are for the institution. And then the trustees need to hold the academic leaders accountable for moving the institution uh, toward those goals. And, and, and if the academic leaders are not doing the job, then the trustees need to make a change. But the trustees are working in partnership with the university leadership. They're not, they're not working unilaterally. And this report uh, tries to recognize uh, that fact. But the activism of the trustees needs to be expressed in, a, in holding the university leadership accountable for institutional uh, progress. And that means the, the leadership and the trustees need to have a conversation and a common understanding about what the fundamental goals are uh, that, that the university needs to move toward and what are the changes that are necessary uh, uh, to get there. I would just add real quickly that, you know, when you go on a board, sometimes, I mean, you're given tremendous amounts of information. And I don't have to say from my own experience, it's, it's, it's terrific and very responsive and all that. But sometimes it takes a while to, so that you figure out which questions to ask. And maybe we're not even asking the questions, uh, like, for example, I said, the student feedback. I mean, I've, I've never received feedback as to whether our students are having a happier disappointing experience, but those are questions that are very important for the future, but maybe they're not questions that are, are being posed today. So it's, it's experience that helps you frame that uh, and make it less contentious. It can still be cooperative, but you, you do have to challenge, and I think that's the point of uh, this report. So. One, one thing that, and, and Tom, maybe you want to comment is, because I've, I've not actually been a trustee, I've appointed lots of them, but never was one myself. But I, I think the continuing education recommendations and the basically the training uh, recommendations are, are pretty novel in here, or novel in the sense they're, they're, they're novel for this population. They're not at all novel if you're going on a board of a, a public company. Uh, usually there's an onboarding process. There's some pretty significant uh, training. There's ongoing directors forums and places where you can go and you can talk with people who are in a similar situation about their experiences. As governors, we did that. Members of Congress do that. But I, I think this is an area, and while the report cites a couple of states that have done something, it's also very important that this be done on a multi-state or across the nation basis. So, because it isn't, you know, you're, you're competing globally today. You ought to understand what is best practice among the American system. and and even have an awareness of what's happening in, outside our borders, but, but at least, and, and I think that, that kind of training, uh, you know, I, I read, as, as somebody who made it a lot of appointments, I read that and I thought, you know, that's something that we did not do well. We had a, a, a mini process, but frankly, a lot of trustees, and you, you can see how good Benno is here. You put a trustee in Benno's hands, he can mold his trustee pretty quickly. You know, he'll, he'll develop that trustee to think the right way, you know, and good leaders can do that. Uh, and and there, is, there is a healthy relationship, but it has to be, anyway. I, I, I agree with you. So I, I, if I can just, just add, I, I think the, the, the issue of, of, of 
feeling intimidated by by um, um, by the specialized knowledge needed to to make academic decisions is not unique to trustees. Um, presidents are under the same pressure. Deans are under the same the, the same same pressure. I had department heads where where you know my department meetings would would, would consist of department heads telling me I, I didn't know what I was talking about. I couldn't couldn't <laughs> couldn't couldn't possibly have the amount of, of specialized knowledge that it, it it took to promote this particular program as the most important program in the world. Um, and 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 that that just kind of bubbles bubbles up through 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 higher education. So so when it reaches Governing boards, you know, it, it may be a different kind of conversation, but it, it's actually part of a continuum that that, that, that flows that that flows through the through the system. And, and I, I think the, and the intent of your question was, was exactly the right one. Sim, simply asking, what does it mean? Why are you why are you doing this? What does it cost? Is there a better way? Is there a better way to do it? It's exactly the same questions that administrators are asking asking down the line. So for for trustees to ask those questions, I think. Yeah, you know, although there's a lot of bluster in the in, in, in the process, um, it makes makes perfect sense. Governor Tom Kane, who was the governor of New Jersey mm -hmm. after he left office, became the, uh, the president of Drew University, and he perfectly captured this. That's a line I, I always remembered when he told the story. He said, "Being president of the university was the first job that he ever had where every decision that he made was treated as a request for a meeting." <laughs> 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 Sums it up. Huh? Yes. Um, well, I'll, I'll throw out a few ideas and let, let you discuss them. Back to preparation for college. Um, some things I look at are I've seen articles recently questioning whether a college should be a training ground for a job. Well, it's, I know what I think about that since I was a music major who ended up developing computer systems. So, but then, what has happened to the technical school to which people used to go naturally and do quite well and we had skilled workers? Could you just discuss that whole issue of, I think they're all now going to college. Well, I, I guess we've been spending a lot of time with that issue, but I think that the, um, that there, there are a lot of changes, some much for the better, that are taking place. Uh, in, in terms of the uh, involvement of the employer committee writ large in, in having a conversation with the community college about what kind of training is required. The president, in signing recently a Work Opportunity and Investment Act, which was a bipartisan effort on the part of Congress, the Republican Democrats all got together. It took a long time, but they got it done. He signed it, and it, uh, it builds on this idea that uh, what you'd like to have at your at the community college level, where you're dealing with skills and careers and occupations, is is the kind of training that's actually aligned with what the jobs are, because unfortunately, in this whole income inequality debate that's going on in the country, we've got a lot of people who are sort of at the, you know, trying to get on the ladder or on the bottom rungs of the ladder, trying to get training, and they may have a wall full of certificates of the training they've achieved, but unfortunately, it had nothing to do with the jobs that were available. So we have a problem in the country in terms of labor market analysis, that's not very good as a, as, a, as a skill that we have, so that needs to be better to help inform schools. But then the involvement of the employer community with the education uh, institutions is really working in, uh, Richard talked about a program that uh, Georgia Tech has, AT&T is very much a part of that, and, and that was designed, elements of that were designed to meet exactly what AT&T needed. And they're recognizing that training, and they they're actually paying for employees of their company to become part of that program. In Maryland, in that system, uh, companies like uh, uh, Northrop Grumman, for example, have worked on, uh, on data analytics and cybersecurity programming, where they've sat down and literally said, you know, the the graduates that are coming out don't have what we need, but this is what we do need, and uh, a collaborative process has resulted in uh, some very effective things. So there's some bright spots all over the country. One of the challenges that I think education has is true at every level, we don't replicate success very fast. And we, we have some incredibly smart things being done that are going on that hold much promise. We just need to pick up the pace. 
is part of the problem, um, whereas it used to be a community issue. They went, they grew up in the community, they went to their local school, and they worked there, and now it's more at least national. Well, local. it is, but that's addressed in part by having the, the, the credentialing, and, and one of the efforts that's been underway is to get a lot of the national, where it's a retail federation, manufacturing organization, healthcare organizations, oil and gas industry to say what are the things that, what are the occupations and the careers and what credential, if achieved, then is recognized across your industry. It's a very complex problem, but again, the, there's, a, there's an awful lot of interest and effort being done. And uh, this is a part of what we're saying here, but I would, I would say one of the important things to note about the community college system is that some of the people in that system and unfortunately can be as high as 20% or I've, I've heard higher even, have a four-year baccalaureate degree, which didn't lead to the job. And now they're back burdened with debt, trying to get a skill so they can get a job. Yeah. And we ought to, I'd say reverse that process. Let's get somebody employed, get them working, and then they can, you know, the delivery systems in higher education are, are changing and multiplying. So. I, I think I mean this is this is part of the new era discussion. So 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 the expectation for for um, um, being trained for a future a future career, I think is very different when a family is is spending two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for an education versus when it's essentially it's essentially free. Uh, if you I mean if you look at what happens in European universities even today, um, by and large free. Uh, um, public education for for anyone who who can walk in the in the door. Students don't particularly tie their majors to future future career goals, and and I, I can't find anyone who who would say that European universities have been spectacularly successful uh, uh, institutions. Uh, and 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 in the U.S. we've adopted a very different model since since the land grant act since since the Morrill Act in the in the 19th century. We we've said part of the mission that universities have. Is to train people for this for this this growing country, and and now that that the cost of doing that is being borne by families, the the expectation that the family has for getting something for that that large investment, I, I think, is entirely appropriate. Uh, yeah, we'll take a, one more question. We've been at this for over an hour. I think we should probably wind up after this question. Yes. This is just a practical question, and that is um, to ensure that students are getting the value that they're investing in their education. What sorts of evidence should trustees be looking at um, in order to determine whether students are being well served by the university? And the second part of that question is how transparent should colleges and universities be about that evidence? Well, I have a, a pretty strong view about that. Uh, I, I think. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of uh, evidence that's internally generated by the university about credit retention, about graduation rates, uh, and and but I think, in addition to the internally generated evidence, my own opinion is that trustees need some external objective measures of what students know and, and are able to do at various points so that they can judge the universities, uh, uh, the value that students are getting and compare it to what students are getting in other universities. So I think trustees need to look at um, things like the collegiate learning assessment, for example, uh, which uh, looks at the problem solving and communication writing skills, it's not a disciplinary kind of a, a, a assessment at all. But it, it looks at it on an objective level and it can enables you to compare where freshmen are to where seniors are or, or graduates and so forth. So uh, we've used external uh, assessment at CUNY as a way of moving the, the performance of the institution and I think without the external objective assessment data, we would not have had a good understanding of what the strengths and weaknesses uh, of the CUNY system uh, in, fact, in fact were. I think this is one area where trustees now 
are least well informed is about student learning outcomes in their institution. I mean, they know the internal evidence, what the graduation rates are and so on, but I think uh, in terms of being able to measure their institution against other institutions, look at what is the actual value added uh, by the institution compared with other similar institutions. Uh, and I think that's extremely important uh, information for trustees to have. We've done some external surveying of economic impact. You know, when you graduate, the kind of job you have, the kind of income you have, that's been very valuable too. So, but that's another metric, you know, seeing how they succeed in the workforce. Yeah, I mean, I think you also need to look at professional licensing exams. For example, if you have nursing education programs, how do they, how do the, how do the graduates fare? Or if it's a law school, a bar exam will tell you something. Uh, medical school, there's some, there's some board measures and so forth. I think trustees need to look at both the internal data and get as much external data as they can. I mean, it's not, it's not covered by rankings, for sure. It's not covered yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and, and the, the, the difficulty is that, that, that even, even with, these, with these good instruments, the skills that we're trying to teach won't peak till 10 years after graduation. How in the world do you test, how in the world do you, do you, do you test for that? So, so, so the increasing sophistication of figuring out you know, where people who are successful in, in their later careers came from, why were they successful, I think is a big, is a big piece. I'll, I'll just mention historically black colleges and universities since no one ever, ever, ever talks about HB, HBCUs. There was a time, they're under tremendous pressure, but there was a time when if you were a black graduate of a medical school or, or a black PhD, chances were overwhelming you got your undergraduate degree at an HBCU. So, so you, look, you look back at, 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 at success later in life, what was, what was the preparation that, that, that got you there? So, so trustees need to focus on, on those, on those long-term issues and, and just looking at what happens on a test score uh, in senior year doesn't, doesn't capture it. Well, thank you all. We've been I'll at this for that. more than an I'll hour. Circle back. I'll uh, circle I want to thank my um, okay. fellow fellow panelists uh, 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 for joining me. Thank you for your uh, questions and for your attention. Uh, and uh, I hope you'll read this report and think about it. And um, thanks for being with us this morning. Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.